There are two ways normally used to make an arch top. The first and traditional method is by carving from a solid block. Alternatively, particularly for a semi-acoustic electric, you can invest in a massive heated press to form a laminated top, like this Gibson factory press. Hi everybody, I'm Drew. In this video, I'm going to show you how I take the thin material that you normally use for the soundboard for your guitar and press it into an arch top. Stick around, I'll show you how it's done. To start, you need an outline plan of your guitar shape. Now I plotted this using Microsoft Excel, but my first prototypes were simply drawn using good old fashioned paper and muck pencil. Notice the sharpie black line that I've drawn freehand for the outline of the frame that I'm going to make to help me bend the wood. I'm going to use two pieces of 1 inch by 1 16th inch gauge aluminum angle or aluminium angle if you prefer, which I first drilled and bolted back to back at each end, with the holes being close to the outer edge. Measure the length of the first segment and transfer that to the angle. Now cut completely down one side with a fine tooth hacksaw. I'm going to be speeding up a lot of this video so we can get through this quickly. OK, now clamp the aluminum in the vise and bend it back freehand to the first angle. Check it against your template and adjust if you need to. Looks about right. Then mark the length for the second segment. Before we make the next cut, we're going to drill another bolt hole on the other side of the cut, staying close to the outer edge, and then put another nut and bolt in and tighten it down. Make the second cut as before, then clamp it and bend to the second angle, being careful not to disturb the first bend. Right, you've probably got the hang of that, so keep going, making bolt holes, cuts and bends, and checking against the template. When you get to the point where the curve reverses, you're going to need to make two cuts and cut out a wedge. Make sure the wedge is just wide enough to allow you to bend to the angle you need. Keep checking against your template and make any small tweaks to the angles that you might need as you go. You can see I've made holes to allow bolts about every two to three inches apart as I go along and a few more at the ends. Here's the frame finished. Next I'm cutting out two compression plates from thin gauge galvanized sheet steel. I've drilled holes to match the frame and bolted the whole lot together. You can see it's going to hold the wood pretty tightly in the frame. From the same sheet steel, I've cut some slipper pieces that you'll see me using later to help me slide the former in and out. I'm using three pairs of these and they just slip down in between with the tops bent over to hold them in place. Now here's the forward that you'll see me using later, though you only need one. I've used a contour map to first drill depth holes in two pieces of six inch by one inch pine and then machine them into shape using my belt sander. I screwed the two halves together using tons of screws and then did the final sanding making sure the shape is symmetrical. It's very important that the side profile is identical on the two halves and that the sides taper down to a thin edge all the way around. Lastly, I'm going to need a frame to hold the sides while they're drying and I've made this out of three quarter inch plywood. Notice that the screws are only around the very outside edge and they don't actually go through the body wood. Okay, if you're looking for a wood with better acoustic properties, then you're going to need something like spruce, like these soundboards from Stu Mac. If it's more of a semi-acoustic electric you're building, then you might use something like this Coca Bola or say maple. Here I'm resawing a two inch blank I bought off eBay down into four millimeter thick boards.
this nice old mahogany came from an old shelf. And again, I've re-sawn it into 4mm book match boards. Next step is to cut the two book matched sheets together to fit the frame. Now, if you don't have a wide enough board, you can actually make a four piece top by using two additional center strips. Okay, this is a big roll of polythene sheet tubing I happen to have, but all you actually need is just two two foot square sheets of thick polythene. We're gonna make a big poly bag. Lay your pieces out and cut the polythene to approximate size. Place the boards between the top and bottom poly sheets and trim. Now it's very important to notice that the two sides of the top are not facing each other. Using a freezer bag sealer, double seal your way around the outside edge to make a big bag. I'm double sealing the edges just because I don't want them to leak or burst when I put water in it, as I'm going to do in a minute. Okay, my bag is finished, but I've left about a two inch gap in the side to fill it with water. There, just a final check that I have the board orientated correctly. Now off to the kitchen. I'm filling it with hot water, but only putting enough in to completely cover the boards, say about a pint. You don't have to fill the bag right up, and you certainly don't want the bag so full that it bursts all over the kitchen floor. When I've excluded all the air, I clamp it shut with a bag clamp and leave things to soak for maybe 15 minutes or so till the wood is nicely saturated. Now drain as much of the water out as you can and then it's back to the workbench. Clamp the boards into the frame and then drill the first hole. Bolt the frame and the sides together with the compression plates at one end. Then drill and bolt the opposite end. Once you have the two ends bolted, you can make your way around drilling and bolting the sides together until the whole thing is assembled. Don't over tighten the nuts and bolts. I have my drill set to minimum torque here, just about finger tight. It's a nice tight sandwich and you can see now why we place the two sides opposing each other in the bag to start so that when folded together, the top is open. Now I'm placing the slippers that we made earlier down in between the two sides, ready for the next step, where we're going to push the former into place. You can see it's very tight in there. There's no way you can get the former in at the moment. However, by the time we finished, this former is going to need to be pushed right the way down to the bottom. Now when I first started doing this, I used these disposable aluminum foil pans, but they are not very strong or very deep, so I don't really recommend them. These days I use this canteen heating pan, which is perfect. Right, I'm outside on my camping stove and I've got about four inches of water boiling in my pan. First I'm going to get my former heated up. So I'm putting it in the water and allowing it to heat up for at least 10 minutes. Then I'm putting the frame in with the former placed on top to stay warm and using the aluminum pan as a lid to keep everything on the boil. I let it simmer now for about five minutes or so, then flip it over for about another five minutes till it's well heated through on both sides. Okay, now the fun part. I'm using my barbecue tongs and heat proof rubber mitts here and I'm quickly pulling the frame out and draining any excess water so I don't scold myself. Now 
Now I quickly push the former in, about as far as I can get it. Here's where those compression plates are really working for us. They are stopping the wood from stretching and splitting. I'm tapping it in, but I'm not going to force it. I can't get the former all the way in in one go, so I'm going to put it back in for a few minutes more to reheat. Notice that the bag is working great. Hardly any oils have been washed out of the wood. The bag is just allowing the boards to be steamed rather than boiled. Without it, most of the oils and colour would wash out of the boards and they would be very dry and brittle and weak when they dried out. Another five minutes and again I'm gently tapping the former down. This time it slides all the way in. Back in the water for another five minute heating cycle to help it settle into shape and then it's about done. Turn off the gas and one last push into place. Now, out with the slippers. You don't want to leave those in, otherwise they might distort the wood as it dries. Now everything is splayed apart somewhat, so to keep the shape, I'm going to clamp the sides down on the former as it dries. I've also split the polythene to drain any water that might have seeped in and allow the wood to start cooling. About 30 minutes later and we're out on the bench to remove the nuts and bolts and the compression bands. We can now remove the sides from the polythene to allow them to dry. You can see the cooled sides have retained the shape of the former. But they are wet and as they dry they will warp and distort unless we keep them held in shape. So now I'm placing them into the plywood frames that we made earlier. The frames clamp the sides but are not over tightened. The wood needs to be able to move around, otherwise if it's clamped too tight, the sides can split. Ask me how I know. With the former slid back into place, reapply the clamps to hold the shape. Now I'm going to put the whole assembly away somewhere in the house at room temperature to dry out for at least a week or two. So here's the dried out top, and I'm just taping this to a piece of plywood with a straight edge to enable me to cut each side roughly to width. I'm going to use a maple spacer as an accent, but that's optional. This can also be used to give some extra strength to the top if you want. Now I've screwed one side down to a shooting board here and I'm going to plane that center cut nice and straight and square on both halves of the top.
you can see it sits snugly against the center spacer. Next, over to this rather odd shaped piece of board that I've actually screwed down to my worktop. Notice the cling wrap or cling film. That's to stop the top gluing itself to the board. I'm going to screw the first half firmly down around its outside edge using screws with washers under them so the screws don't split the wood. Glue up the edge and the spacer using tight bond or the glue of your choice. Now I didn't have the camera very well positioned so I'm going to switch to a second spruce top to show this next part. On this one I have a walnut accent running down the middle. Again that's optional. Okay, here I'm lining up the two halves and pushing them hard together, tightening a screw at either end to hold it down tight. Now I'm using this simple tool, just a block of wood with a slot cut in it, to check that the two sides are at the same level all the way along the center. If one side is a little higher, you can simply press it down. With the two halves lined up, I'm now going to screw the second half down. Now for all the other screws holding down this side, I tighten down the screw and then just back off about an eighth of a turn, just enough to allow the washer to turn freely. That's going to keep the side flat, but allow it to slide as I clamp it. Carry on screwing down in the same way all around the periphery of the side, and then finally clamp it using two long clamps. Do a final check just to make sure the two sides are lined up. Right, back to the mahogany top which is now glued up nicely. You can see that the maple separator can also act as a brace to strengthen the top if you're not too worried about its acoustic properties, say for a semi-acoustic. The separator does make it pretty stiff, but I'm going to do an initial sanding of the top to make sure the two sides match up and at the same time sand away most of the underside of the center separator to allow it to flex a bit more. Okay, that pretty much wraps up how to make the basic top. You can now treat it like a conventional carved arch top, cutting it to fit your body shell and sanding down to the thickness you want. You're going to need some bracing under the top, but that's going to be very dependent upon the design of your body shell and what type of tonal properties you're looking for. Remember that the downward forces on the bridge are going to act to try to make the arch collapse and that's going to create spreading forces against the outer sides of the body. So you probably need to add some bracing to counter that. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy this video. If you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the comments below and I'll see what I can do to answer them. See you later.